The Traitor by David Weber. Cold, bone dry winter wind moaned as the Titanic vehicle rumbled down the valley at a steady 50 kilometers per hour. Eight independent suspensions, four forward and four aft, spread across the full width of its gigantic hull, supported it, and each 10 meter wide track sank deep into the soil of the valley floor. A dense cloud of dust, talcum fine, abrasive, and choking as death, plumed up from the road wheels five meters high. But the moving mountain's 30 meter high turret thrust his hellbore clear of the churning cocoon. For all its size and power, it moved with an unearthly quiet, and the only sounds were the whine of the wind and the soft purr of fusion powered drive trains, the squeak of bogies, and the muted clatter of track links. The bolo ground forward, sensor head swiveling, and the earth trembled with its passing. It rolled through thin, blowing smoke and the stench of high explosives with ponderous menace, altering course only to avoid the deepest craters and twisted wrecks of alien fighting vehicles. In most places, those wrecks lay only in ones and twos. In others, they were heaped in shattered breastworks, clustered so thickly it was impossible to bypass them. When that happened, the eerie quiet of the bolo's advance vanished into the screaming anguish of crushing alloy as it forged straight ahead, trampling them under its 13,000 tons of death and destruction. It reached an obstacle too large for even it to scale. Only a trained eye could have identified it from that thorn and blasted corpse as another bolo, turned broadside on to block the enemy's passage even in death. The wrecked hellbore was still trained down the valley, Missile cell hatches open and empty wells had exhausted their ammunition. Fifteen enemy vehicles lay dead before it, mute testimony to the ferocity of its last stand. But the living Bolo didn't even pause. There was no point, for the dead Bolo's incandescent dur alloy hull radiated the waste heat of the failing fusion bottle which had disemboweled it. Not even its unimaginably well-armored survival center could have survived, and the living Bolo simply altered its heading to squeeze past it. Igneous rock cried out in pain as moving armored flanks scraped the valley face on one side, and the dead bolo shuddered on the other as his brother's weight shouldered it aside. The moving bolo had passed four dead brigade mates in the last 30 kilometers, and itself was not unwounded. Two of its starboard infinite repeaters had been blasted into mangled wreckage. Energy weapon hits had sent molten splatters of dura alloy weeping down its glassy plate to freeze like tears of pain. A third of its sensor rays had been stripped away by a near miss, and its forward starboard track shield was jammed in a lowered position, buckled and rent by enemy fire. Its turret bore the ID code 25D0098ART and the unsheathed golden sword of the battalion commander. Yet, it was alone. Only one other unit of its battalion survived, and that unit lay ahead, beyond this death-choked valley. It was out there somewhere moving even now through the trackless, waterless badlands of the planet Camelan, and Unit ART of the line rumbled steadily down the valley to seek it out. I interrogate my inertial navigation system as I approach the immediate objective. The INS is not the most efficient way to determine my position, but Camelan's entire orbital network, including recon and navsats, as well as the communication relays, perished in the enemy's first strike, and the INS is adequate. I confirm my current coordinates and grind forward, leaving the valley at last. What lies before me was once a shallow cup of fertile green among the lava fields. Now it is a blackened pit, and as my four optical heads sweep the ruins of town of Moorville, I feel the horror of human mass death. There is no longer a need for haste. I devote a full 6.007 seconds to the initial sweep. I anticipate no threats, but my on-site records will be invaluable to the court of inquiry I know will be convened to pass judgment upon my brigade. I am aware of my own fear that the court's verdict and its implications for all bolos, but I am a unit of the line. This too, however bitter, is my duty, and I will not flinch from it. I have already observed the massive casualty C Company inflicted upon the enemy in its fighting retreat up Black Rock Valley. The enemy's vehicles are individually smaller than bolos, ranging from 500.96 standard tons no more than 4,982.07 standard tons, but heavily armed for their size. They are also manned, not self-aware, and he has lost many of them. Indeed, I estimate the aggregate tonnage of his losses in Black Rock Valley 
alone is the equivalent of at least three Bolo regiments. We have yet to determine this enemy's origins or the motive for his assault on Camlan, but the butchery to which he has willingly subjected his own personnel is sobering evidence of his determination or fanaticism. Just as the blasted body-strewn streets of Morville are ample proof of his ferocity, 71 more wrecked enemy vehicles choke the final approach to the town, and two far larger wrecks loom among them. I detect no transponder codes, and the wreckage of my brigade mates is so blasted that even I find it difficult to identify what remains. Yet I know who they were. Unit 25D-1162 HNR and Unit 25D-0982 JSN of the line have fought their last battle, loyal to the death of their human creators. I reach out to them, hoping against hope that some whisper from their final refuge of their survival centers will answer my transmission. But there is no reply. Like the other bolos I have passed this day, they are gone beyond recall, and the empty spots they once filled the total system's data sharing net ache within me as I move slowly forward, alert still for enemy vehicles hiding among the wreckage. There are none, only the dead, the enemy dead and 6,000 human dead, and my brothers who died knowing they had failed to save them. This is not the first time units of the line have died, nor the first time they have died in defeat. There's no shame in that, only sorrow, but we not always end in victory, yet there's cause for shame here, for there are only two dead bullets before me, and there should be three. Wind moans over the wreckage as I pick my way across the killing ground, my brother's fire shattered three enemy attacks before the fourth overran them. Without the recon satellites, there's no independent record of their final battle, but my own sensor data, combined with their final TSDS transmissions, allow me to deduce what had passed here. I understand their fighting withdrawal down the Black Rock Valley and the savage artillery and missile barrages which flayed them as they fought. I grasp their final maneuvers from the patterns of wreckage, recognize the way the enemy crowded upon them as his steady pounding crippled their weapons. I see the final positions they assumed, standing at last against the enemy's fire because they could no longer retreat without abandoning Morville. And I see the final third position from which a single bolo did retreat, falling back fleeing into the very heart of the town he was duty-bound to defend. I track his course by the crushed and shattered wreckage of buildings to see the bodies of Camlan militia who died as he fled, fighting with their manned portable weapons against an enemy who could destroy 13,000 ton bolos. There are many enemy wrecks along his course, clear evidence of how he desperately the militia opposed the invaders' advance, even as the bolo abandoned Moorville, fleeing north into the Badlands, where the enemy's less capable vehicles could not pursue. And I know who left the humans to die. Unit 25D-0103, LNC at the line. Charlie Company Command Bolo. My crash mate and battle companion. My most trusted company commander. I have fought beside him many times. Known his utter reliability in the face of the enemy. But I know him no longer. For he has done the unforgivable. He is the first, the only Bolo to ever desert in the face of the enemy. Banning those we are bound to protect to the death and beyond. For the first time in the history of the Dynachrome Brigade, we know shame. We know fear. As LNC, I am a Mark 25 Model D, the first production model bullet to be allowed. Complete, permanent self-awareness, and LNC's actions attack the very foundation of that decision, which made us fully self-realized personalities. We've repeatedly demonstrated how much more effective our own awareness makes us in battle, yet our freedom of action makes us unlike any previous units of the Brigade. We are truly autonomous, and if one of us can choose to flee, if one of us can succumb to cowardice, perhaps all of us can. I complete my survey of the site in 4.307 minutes. There are no survivors, enemy, human, or bolo in Moorville, and I report my grim confirmation of my brigade commander and my surviving brothers and sisters. The enemy surprise attack, coupled with our subsequent losses in combat, have reduced our 6th brigade to only 14 units. Our acting commander is a Lieutenant Castro, the most junior and sole surviving human of our command staff. The commander is only 24 standard years of age, on her first posting to an active duty brigade, and the exhaustion in her voice is terrible to hear, yet she has done her duty superbly, and I feel only shame and bitter, bitter guilt, and I must impose this additional decision upon her. I taste the matching shame and guilt of surviving handful of my brothers and sisters over the TSDS, but none of them can assist me. The enemy is in full retreat to his spaceheads, 
Yet the fighting continues at a furious pace. No other bolos can be diverted from it until victory is assured. And so, I am alone, come to investigate and confirm the unbelievable events here. For I am the commander of LNC's battalion. It is up to me to do what must be done. All right, Arthur, Lieutenant Ketchell says finally. We've got the situation in hand here. And Admiral Shigmasu's last subspace flash puts 9th Fleet just 35 hours out. We can hold the bastards without you. Go do what you have to do. Yes, Commander, I reply softly, and pivot on my tracks, turning my prow to the north. Follow LNC's trail into the lava fields. Unit 25D-0103, LNC of the line, churned down across the merciless terrain. Both outboard port tracks have been blown away, and bare road reels groaned in protest as they chewed through rock and gritty soil. His armored hull was gouged and torn, his starboard infinite repeaters and anti-personnel clusters a tangled mess of ruin, and his builders had designed him well. His war... His core war hull had been breached in three places, wreaking havoc among many of his internal systems, yet his main armament remained intact, and he knew he was pursued. LNC paused, checking his position against his... LNC paused, checking his position against his internal navigation system and the maps in his main memory. It was a sign of his brutal damage that he required almost 20 full seconds to determine his location, and then he altered course. The depression was more than a crevasse than a valley, a sunken trough, barely half again the width of his hull that plunged deep into the level of the fissure and lava fields. He would offer LNC cover as he made his painful way across towards the distant Avalon Mountains, and a cloud of dust whisked away on the icy winter wind as he vanished into the shadowed cleft. I try to deduce LNC's objective, assuming that he has one beyond simple flight, but the task is beyond me. I can extrapolate the decisions of a rational foe, yet the process requires some understanding of his motives. I am no longer understanding of LNC's motives. I replay the final TSDS transmission from 25D 1162 HNR and experience once more the sensation of a human might defined as a chill of horror as LNC suddenly withdraws from the data net. I share HNR's attempt to reestablish the net, feel LNC's savage rejection of all communication, and then I watch through HNR's sensors as LNC abandons his position, wheeling back towards Moorville while enemy fire bellows and thunders about him. I experience HNR's final shock as his own as his company commander responds to his repeated queries by pouring hellbore fire straight into his unprotected rear. LNC's actions are impossible, yet the data is irrefutable. He has not only fled the enemy, but killed one of his own brigade mate, and his refusal to even acknowledge communication attempts is absolute. That too is impossible. Any bolo must respond to the priority comm frequencies, yet LNC does not. He has not only committed mutiny and treason, but refused to hear any message from Lieutenant Kestrel, as he might reject an enemy communication seizure attempt. How any Bolo could ignore his own brigade commander is beyond my comprehension, yet he has. And because there's no longer any communication interface at all, Lieutenant Kestrel cannot even access the total system's override program to shut him down. None of my models or extrapolations can suggest a decision matrix which would generate such actions on LNC's part, but perhaps that is the point. Perhaps there is no decision matrix, only panic. Yet, if that is true, what will he do when the panic passes? If it passes, surely he must realize his own fate is sealed. Whatever the outcome of the enemy's attack, how can I anticipate rational decisions from him under such circumstances? I grind up another slope in his tracks. He has altered course once more, swinging west. I consult my internal maps. His base course has been towards the Avalon Mountains and I note the low ground to the west. He is no longer on at least time heading for the mountains. The long, deep valley will take him there eventually. It will also afford him excellent cover and numerous ambush positions. I am tempted to cut across country and head him off, but if I do that and he is not in fact headed for the mountains, I may lose him. He cannot hide indefinitely, yet my shame and grief and sense of betrayal will not tolerate delay. I know from HNR's last transmission that LNC's damage is much worse than my own. I consider options and alternatives for 0.0089 seconds and then head down the slope in his weight. 
unit LNC slowed as the seismic sensors he deployed along his back trail reported the ground shocks of a pursuing vehicle in the 13,000 ton range. He had known pursuit would come, yet he had hoped for a greater head start, for he had hundreds of kilometers still to go, and his damaged suspension had reduced his best sustained speed to barely 46 kilometers per hour. He must reach the Avalons. No enemy could be permitted to stop him. Yet, the remote sensor had made it clear the enemy which now pursued him was faster than he. But there were ways to slow this hunter, and he deployed another pair of seismic sensors while his optical heads and sonar considered a fissured rock strata around him. I am gaining on LNC. His track damage must be worse than I had believed, and the faint emissions of his power plants have come to me from ahead. I know it is hopeless, yet even now I cannot truly believe he's totally lost to all he once was. So I activate the TSDS once more and broadcast strongly on C Company's frequency, begging him to respond. Unit LNC picked up the powerful transmissions and felt contempt for those who sent them. Could his pursuer truly believe he would fall for such an obvious ploy that he would respond, give away his position and possibly even accept communication and allow access to his core programming? LNC recognized the communications protocols. But that meant nothing. LNC no longer had allies, friends, war brothers or sisters. There were only the enemy and the Avalon Mountains, which drew so slowly, agonizingly closer. But even as LNC ignored the communications attempt, he was monitoring the seismic sensors he deployed. He matched the position against those sensors he reported against his own terrain and sent the execution code. Demolition charges roar. The powerful explosions like thunder and a restricted clap. I understand their purpose instantly, yet there's no time to evade as the cliffs about me shudder. It is a trap. The passage is narrowed to little more than the width of my hull, and LNC is mined the sheer walls on either hand. I throw maximum power to my tracks, fighting to speed clear, but hundreds of thousands of tons of rock are in motion, cascading down upon me. My kinetic battle screens could never resist such massive weights. I deactivate it to prevent its burnout as the artificial avalanche crashes over me. Pain sensors flare as boulders batter my flanks. Powertrain components scream in protest as many times my own weight and crushed rock and shifting earth sweep over me. I am forced to shut them down as well. I can only ride out the cataclysm, and I take grim note that LNC has lost none of his cunning and his cowardice. It takes 4.761 minutes for the avalanche to complete my immobilization. Another 6.992 minutes before the last boulder slams to rest. I have lost 14.37% of more than my sensors, and most of these of which remain are buried under meters of debris. But a quick diagnostic check reveals that no core systems have suffered damage, and sonar pulses probe the tons of broken rock which overlay me, generating a chart of my overburden. All is not lost. LNC's trap has immobilized me, but only temporarily. I calculate that I can work clear of the debris in not more than 71.65 minutes, and jammed boulders shift as I begin to rock back and forth in my tracks. LNC's remote sensors reported the seismic echoes of his pursuer's efforts to dig free. For a long moment, almost, 0.3037 seconds, he considered turning to engage his immobilized foe, but only for a moment. LNC's Hellwolf remained operational, but he had expended 96% of his depletable munitions, and his starboard infinite repeaters were completely inoperable, as this was his command and control system's efficiency was badly degraded. Even his battle reflex functioned only erratically, and he knew his reactions were slow, without the flashing certainty with which he had always been his. His seismic sensors would give no detailed information on his hunter, yet his enemy was almost certainly more combat-worthy than he and his trap was unlikely to have inflicted decisive damage. No, it was the mountains which mattered, the green, fertile mountains, and LNC dared not risk his destruction before he reached them, and so he resisted the temptation to turn at bay and ground on steadily toward the frozen, waterless badlands on tracks and the naked road wheels. I worked my way free at last, Dirt and broken rock shower from my flanks as my tracks heave me up out of the rubble-clogged slot. More dirt and boulders crown my war hull and block number 3 and number 14 optical heads. Yet I remain operational at 89.051% of base capacity, 
I have learned that the detonation of his demolition charges was LNC's response to my efforts to communicate. The brother who fought at my side for 21 standard years is truly no more. All that remains is the coward, the deserter, the betrayer of trust who will stop at nothing to preserve himself. I will not forget again, and I can no longer deceive myself into believing that he can be convinced to give himself up. The only gift I can offer him now is his destruction, and I throw additional power to my tracks that I go in pursuit to give it to him. LNC's inboard Ford port suspension screamed in protest as the damaged track blocked part at last. The fleeing Bolo shuddered as he ran Ford off the track, leaving it twisted and trampled in his wake. The fresh damage slowed him still further. He staggered drunkenly as his unbalanced suspension sought to betray him. Yet he forced himself back onto his original heading, and his deployed remotes told him that the enemy was gaining once more. His turret swiveled, training his hellboard directly astern. He poured still more power into his remaining tracks. Drive components heated dangerously under his abuse, but the mountains were closer. I begin picking up LNC's emissions once more. Despite the twisting confines of the valley, they remain too faint to provide an accurate position fix, yet they give me a general bearing and an armored hatch opens as I deploy one of my few remaining reconnaissance drones. LNC detected the drone as it came sweeping up into the valley, and his anti-air defenses, badly damaged at Moorville, were unable to engage, but his massive 90 centimeter hellbore rose like a striking serpent, and a bolt of plasma fit to destroy another bolo howled from its muzzle. My drone has been destroyed, but the manner of its destruction tells me much. LNC would not have engaged with his main battery if his anti-air systems remained effective. That means there's a chink in his defenses. I have expended my supply of fusion warheads against the invaders, but remain 37.961% of my conventional warhead missile load. And if his air defenses have been seriously degraded, then a saturation bombardment may overwhelm his battle screen. Even without a battle screen, chemical explosives would be unlikely to significantly injure an undamaged bolo. Of course, but LNC is not undamaged. I consider the point at which my drone was destroyed and generate a new search pattern. I lock the pattern in, and the drone hatch is open once more. 24 fresh drones, 82.75% of my remaining total streak upwards, and I open my VLS missile cell hatches as well. The drones came screaming north. They didn't come in slowly this time, for they were no longer simply searching for LNC. This time they knew already his approximate location, and their sole task was to confirm it for enemy's fire control. But LNC had known they would be coming. It already pivoted sharply on his remaining tracks and halted, angled across the valley to clear his intact infinite port repeater's field of fire, and heavy ion bolts shrieked up to meet the drones. The surviving slug throwers and laser clusters added their fury. The drones blew apart as if they had run headlong into a wall. Yet effective as his fire was, it was less effective than his crippled air defense systems would have been. And just one drone, just one survived long enough to report his exact position. I am surprised by the efficiency of LNC's fire. My drones have accomplished their mission. More, they have provided my first visual observation of his damages, and I am shocked by their severity. It seems impossible that he can still be capable of movement, far less accurately of directed fire. And despite his cowardice and treason, I feel a stab of sympathy for the agony which must be lashing at him from his pain receptors. Yet he clearly remains combat capable, despite his hideous wounds, and I feed his coordinates to my missiles. It takes .00037 seconds to confirm my targeting solution, and then I fire. Flames bound up from the shadowed recesses of the deep valley as the missile salvos rose and howled north, homing in on their target. Most of ART's birds came in on conventional high trajectory courses, but a third of them came in on low, relying on terrain avoidance radar to navigate straight up the slot of the valley. The hurricane of his fire slashed in on wildly separated bearings, and LNC's crippled active defenses were insufficient to intercept it all. ART emptied his BLS cells, throwing every remaining warhead at his treasonous brigade mate. Just under 400 missiles launched in less than 90 seconds, and LNC writhed as scores of them got through his interception envelope. They pounded his battle screen and ripped and tore at his lacerated armor, and his pain receptor shrieked as fresh damage bit into his wounded war hall. Half his remaining infinite repeaters were blown away, and still more sensor capability was blotted out, and his 13,000 ton bulk shuddered and shook under the merciless bombardment. Yet, he survived. 
the last warhead detonated and his tracks clashed back into motion. He turned ponderously to the north once more, grinding out of the smoke and dust of the roaring brush fires of his enemy's missiles that ignited in the valley's sparse vegetation. That bombardment had exhausted the enemy's ammunition and with it, his indirect fire capability. If it hadn't, he would still be firing upon LNC. He wasn't, which meant if he had meant to destroy LNC now, he must do so with direct fire and he must come within reach of LNC's Hellbore as well. My missile fire has failed to halt LNC. I am certain it has inflicted additional damage, but I doubt it has crippled his Hellbore, and if his main battery remains operational, he retains the capability to destroy me, just as he did HNR at Moorville. He appears to have slowed further still, however, which may indicate my attack has further damaged his suspension. I project his current speed of advance and heading on the maps from main memory. Given my speed advantage, I will overtake him within 2.03 hours, well short of his evident goal. I do not know why he is so intent upon reaching the Avalon Mountains. Unlike humans, bows require neither water nor food, and surely the rocky, barren, crevasse-riddled badlands would provide LNC with better cover than the tree-grown mountains. I try once more to extrapolate his objective, to gain some insight into what now motivates him, and once more, I fail. But it does not matter. I will overtake him over 70 kilometers from the mountains, and when I do, one or both of us will die. LNC ran the projections once more. It was difficult, for damaged core computer sections fluctuated, dropping in and out of his net, but even in his crippled capabilities sufficed to confirm his fears. The enemy would overtake him within a little more than 100 minutes, and desperation filled him. It was not an emotion earlier marks of bowls had been equipped to feel, or at least recognize when they did, but LNC had come to know it well. He had felt it from the moment he realized his company couldn't save Moorville, that the enemy would break through them and crush the humans they fought to protect. But it was different now, darker, more bitter, stark with how close he'd come to reaching the mountains after all. Yet the enemy hadn't overtaken him yet, and he consulted his maps once more. I detect explosions ahead. I did not anticipate them, but 0 0.0761 seconds of analysis confirmed that they are demolition charges once more. Given how many charges LNC used in an earlier ambush, these explosions must constitute his entire remaining supply of demolitions. I wonder why he's expended them. Confused seismic shocks come through me through the ground, but they offer no answer to my question. They are consistent with falling debris, but not in sufficient quantity to bar the valley. I cannot deduce any other objective worthy of expenditure of his munitions, yet logic suggests LNC had one which he considered worthwhile, and I advance once more cautiously. LNC waited atop the valley wall. The torturous ascent on his damaged tracks had cost him 50 precious minutes of his lead on the enemy, but his demolitions had destroyed the natural ramp up which he had toiled. He could not directly be pursued now, and he considered simply continuing to run. But once the enemy realized LNC was no longer following the valley, he would no longer feel the need to pursue cautiously. Instead, he would use his superior speed to dash ahead to the valley's terminus. He would emerge from it there, between LNC and his goal, and sweep back to the south, hunting LNC in the Badlands. That could not be permitted. LNC must reach the mountains, and so he waited. Hellbore covering the valley he'd left. With any luck, he might destroy his pursuer once and for all, and even if he failed, the enemy would realize LNC was above him. He would have no choice but to anticipate additional ambushes, and caution might impose the delay LNC needed. I have lost LNC's emission signature. There could be many reasons for that. My own senses are damaged, he may have put a sufficiently solid shoulder of rock between us to conceal his emissions from me, he may even have shut down all systems other than his survival center to play dead. I am tempted to accelerate my advance, but I compute that this is maybe what precisely what LNC wishes me to do. If I go to maximum speed, I may blunder into whatever ambush he has chosen to set. I pause for a moment, then launch one of my five remaining recon drones up into the valley, and move slowly remaining below the tops of the cliffs to conceal its emissions from LNC as long as possible. Its flight profile will limit the envelope of its look down sensors, but it will find LNC wherever he may lie hidden. LNC watched as the drone moved past far below him. It hugged the valley walls and floor. He felt a sense of satisfaction as it disappeared up the narrow cleft without detecting him. 
My drone reports a long, tangled spill of earth and rock across the valley, blasted down from above. It is thick and steep enough to inconvenience me, but not so steep as to stop me. As an attempt to further delay me, it must be futile, but perhaps it is very futility that is indication of LNC's desperation. LNC waited, active emissions reduced to the minimum possible level, relying on purely optical systems for detection and fire control. It would degrade the effectiveness of his targeting still further, but it would also make him far harder to detect. I approached the point which LNC attempted to block the valley. My own sensors, despite their damage, are far more effective than the drones and cover a wider detection arc, and I slow as I consider the rubble. It is indeed too feeble a barrier to halt me, but something about it makes me cautious. It takes almost 0 .0004 seconds to isolate the reason. The enemy appeared below, nosing around the final bend. LNC tracked him optically, watching, waiting for the center of mass shot he required. The enemy edged further forward, and then suddenly threw maximum emergency power into his reverse tracks just as LNC fired. A full-powered Hellbore war shot explodes across my bow as I hurl myself backwards. The plasma bolt misses me by 0.6.52 meters, carving a 40 meter crater into the eastern cliff face, but it has missed me, and it would not have if I hadn't suddenly wondered how LNC had managed to set his charges high enough on the western cliff to blow down so much rubble. Now I withdraw around a bend in the valley, replay my sensor data, and bitter understanding fills me as I see the deep impressions of his track far above. My drone had missed them because it was searching for targets in the valley floor, but LNC was no longer in the valley. He'd escaped from his confines and destroyed the only path by which I might have followed. I sit motionless for 3.026 endless seconds. Considering my options, LNC is above me and I detect his active emissions once more as he brings his targeting system fully back online. He has the advantage of position and knowing where I must appear if I wish to engage him. Yet I have the offsetting advantages of knowing where he is and of initiation, for he cannot precisely know when I will seek to engage. It is not a pleasant situation, yet I conclude the odds favor me by the thinnest of margins. I am less damaged than he. My system's efficiency is higher. My response time is probably lower. I compute a probability of 68.052%, plus or minus 6.119%, that I will get my shot off before he can fire. They are not the odds I prefer, but my duty is clear. LNC eased back to a halt on his crippled tracks. He had chosen his initial position with care, selecting one which would require the minimum movement to reach his next firing spot. Without direct observation, he was forced to rely only on emissions, which must pass through distorting medium of solid rock to reach him. The enemy might not even realize he'd moved at all. Now he waited once more audio receptors filled with the whine of the wind over tortured rock and the rent and torn projections of his own tattered hull. I move. My suspension screams as I redline the drive motors and clouds of pulverized earth and rock spew from my tracks as I erupt out into the open, Hellbore trained on LNC's position. But LNC is not where I thought. He has moved less than 80 meters, just sufficient to put all save his turret behind a solid ridge of rock. His Hellbore leveled across it, and my own turret traverses with desperate speed. It is insufficient. His system's damage slows his reactions, but not enough, and we fire in the same split instant. Plasma bolts shriek past one another, and my rush shot misses. It rips into the crest of his covering ridge, on for deflection but low in elevation. Stone explodes into vapor and screaming splinters, and the kinetic transfer of energy blows a huge scab of rock off the back of the ridge. Several hundred tons of rock crash into LNC, but even as it hits him, his own plasma bolt punches right through my battle screen and strikes squarely on my empty VLS cells. Agony howls through my pain receptors as the plasma carves deep into my hull. Internal disruptor fields fight to confine the destruction, but the wound is critical. Both inboard after powertrains suffer catastrophic damage. After my own fusion plant goes into emergency shutdown, infinite repeaters 6 through 9 and both lateral batteries are silenced and my entire after sensor suite is totally disabled. Yet, despite my damage, my combat reflexes remain unimpaired. My six surviving track systems drag me back out of LNC's field of fire once more, back into the sheltering throat of the valley, even as damage control systems spring into action. I am hurt, badly hurt. I estimate that I am now operable no more than 51.23% of base capability, but I am still functional. 
and I replay the engagement. I realize I should not be. LNC has had ample time for a second shot before I could withdraw, and he should have taken it. LNC staggered as the enemy's plasma bolt carved into his sheltering ridge. The solid rock protected his hull, but the disintegrating ridge crest itself became a deadly projectile. His battle screen was no protection. The plasma bolt's impact point was inside his screen's perimeter. There was nothing to stop the hurtling tons of rock, and they crashed into the face of his turret like some sort of titanic hammer, with a brute force impact that rocked him on his tracks. His armor held, but the stony hammer came up under his hellboard and angle and snapped the weapon's mighty barrel like a twig. Had his hellboard survived, the enemy would have been at his mercy. As it was, he was no longer had a weapon with he could possibly engage his pursuer. Damage control system damps down the last power surges reverberating through my systems, and I am able to take the meaningful stock of my wound. It is even worse than I had anticipated. For all intents and purposes, I am reduced to my hellbore and eight infinite repeaters, five of them in my port battery. Both inner tracks of my aft suspension are completely dead, but damage control has managed to disengage the clutches and the tracks will still support me, and the road wheels will rotate freely. My sensor damage is critical. However, I have been reduced a little more than 15.62% of base sensor capability. I am therefore blind aft and little better than that port and starboard, and the remaining drones have all been destroyed. Yet I compute only one possible reason for LNC's failure to finish me. My near miss must have disabled his hellbore, and so his offensive capabilities are even more severely reduced than my own. I cannot be positive the damage is permanent, as it is possible, even probable since I did not score a direct hit that he will be able to restore the weapon to function. Yet, if the damage is beyond his onboard repair capability, he will be at my mercy, even in my crippled state. But to engage him, I must first find him. And if he chooses to turn away and disappear into the Badlands, locating him may well prove impossible for my crippled sensors. Indeed, if he should succeed in breaking contact with me, seek out some deeply hidden crevasse or cavern and shut down all but his survival center, he might well succeed in hiding from even fleet sensors. Even now, despite his treason and the wounds he's inflicted upon me, a small, traitor's part of me wishes he could just do just that. I remember too many shared battles, too many times in which we fought side by side in the heart of a shrieking violence, and that traitor memory wishes he would simply go, simply vanish, and sleep away his reserve power in dreamless hibernation. But I cannot let him do that. He must not escape the consequences of his actions, and I must not allow him to. His treason is too great, and our human commanders and partners must know that if we of the line share their horror at his actions. I sit motionless for full 5.25 minutes, recomputing options in light of my new limitations. I cannot climb the valley wall after LNC, nor can I rely upon my damaged sensors to find him if he seeks to evade me. Should he simply run from me, he will escape. Yet he has been wedded to the same base course from the moment he abandoned Morville. I still do not understand why, but he appears absolutely determined to reach the Avalon Mountains. And even with my track damage, I remain faster than he is. There was only one possibility. I will proceed at maximum speed to the end of this valley. According to my maps, I should reach it the northern end at least 42.35 minutes before he can attain the cover of the mountains, and I will be between him and his refuge. I will be able to move toward him using my remaining forward sensors to search for and find him, and if his hellbore is indeed permanently disabled, I will destroy him with ease. My plan is not without risks, for my damage sensors can no longer sweep the tops of the valley walls effectively. If his hellbore can be restored to operation, he will be able to choose his firing position with impunity, and I will be helpless before his attack. But risk or no, it is my only option, and if I move rapidly enough, I may well outrun him and get beyond his engagement range before he can make repairs. LNC watched helplessly as the enemy re-emerged from the hiding and sped up the narrow valley. He understood the enemy's logic, and the loss of his hellbore left him unable to defeat it. If he continued toward the Avalons, he would be destroyed, yet he had no choice, and he turned away from the valley, naked road wheels screaming in protest as he battered his way across the ladder of fields. I have reached the end of the valley, they emerged into the foothills of the Avalon Range and altered course to the west. I climbed the nearest hill, exposing only my turret and forward sensor arrays to over its crest, and began the most careful sweep of which I can remain capable. LNC's passive sensors detected the whispering lash of radar and knew he'd lost the race. The enemy was ahead of him, 
waiting, and he ground to a halt. His computer core had suffered additional shock damage when the disintegrating ridge crest smashed into him, and his thoughts were slow. It took him a full 13 seconds to realize what he must do. There was only one thing he could do now. Tommy? Thomas Mallory looked up from where he crouched on the floor of the packed compartment. His eight-year-old sister had sobbed herself out of tears at last, and she'd huddled against his side in the protective circle of his arm. But Thomas Mallory had learned too much about the limits of protectiveness. At 15, he was the oldest person in the compartment, and he knew that many of the others had not yet realized that they would never see their parents again, for the 51 of them were the sole survivors of Moorville. Tommy, the slurred voice said once more, and Thomas cleared his throat. Yes? He heard the quaver in his own voice, but he made himself speak loudly. Despite the air filtration systems, the compartment stank of ozone, explosives, burning organic compounds. He had felt the terrible concussions of combat and knew the vehicle in whose protective belly he sat was savagely wounded. He was no longer certain of how efficient his audio pickups might be. I have failed in my mission, Tommy. The enemy has cut us off from our objective. What enemy? Thomas demanded. Who are they, Lance? Why are they doing this? They are doing it because they are the enemy, the voice replied. There must be a reason, Thomas cried with all the anguish of a 15-year-old heart. They are the enemy, the voice repeated in that eerie, slurred tone. It, it is the enemy's function to destroy, to, to destroy, to, 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 to. the voice chopped off and Thomas swallowed. Lance's response were becoming increasingly less lucid, wandering into repetitive loops that have sometimes faded into silence and other times as now, cut off abruptly. And Thomas Mallory learned about mortality. Even bolos could perish. And somehow he knew Lance was dying by centimeters, even as he struggled to complete his mission. They are the enemy. Lance resumed, and the electronic voice was higher and tauter. There is always the enemy. The enemy must be defeated. The enemy must be destroyed. The enemy. The enemy. The Again, the voice died with the sharpness of an axe blow, and Thomas bit his lip and hugged his sister tight. Endless seconds of silence oozed past, broken only by the whimpers and weeping of the younger children, until Thomas could stand it no longer. Lance? I, I am here, Tommy. The voice was stronger this time, and calmer. What do we do? Thomas asked. There is only one option. A cargo compartment hissed open to reveal a backpack, military comm unit, and an all-terrain survival kit. Thomas had never used a military comm, but he knew it was preset to the Dinochrome Brigade's frequencies. Please take the kit and comm unit, the voice said. All right. Thomas eased his arms from around his sister and lifted the backpack from the compartment. It was much lighter than he expected, and he slipped his arms with the straps and settled it onto his back and then tugged the survival kit out as well. Thank you. Now here is what you must do, Tommy. My questing sensors detect him at last. He's moving slowly, coming in on yet another valley. This one is shorter and shallower, barely deep enough to hide him from my line of fire, and I trace its course along my maps. He must emerge from at approximately 12.98 kilometers to the southwest of my present position and will grind into motion once more. I will enter the valley from the north and sweep along it until we meet. And then I will kill him. Thomas Mallory crouched on the hilltop. It hadn't been hard to make the younger kids hide, not after the horrors they'd seen in Moorville. But Thomas couldn't join them. He had to be here, where he could see the end, for someone had to see it. Someone had to be there, to know how 51 children had been saved from death and to witness the price their dying savior had paid for them. Distance blurred details, hiding Lance's dreadful damage as he ground steadily up the valley, but Thomas's eyes narrowed as he saw the cloud of dust coming to meet him. Tears burned like ice on his cheeks in the sub-zero wind, and he scrubbed at them angrily. Lance deserved those tears, but Thomas couldn't let the other kids see them. There were little enough chance that they could survive even a single Camland winter night, even in the mountains where they would have at least water, fuel, and the means to build some sort of shelter. But it was the only chance Lance had been able to give them. And Thomas would not show weakness before the children, as he was now responsible for driving and goading them into surviving until someone came to rescue them. 
he would not betray the trust the Lance had bestowed upon him. The oncoming dust grew thicker, and he raised the electronic binoculars, gazing through them for his first sight of the enemy. He adjusted their focus on an iodine-colored turret moving from beyond a saddle of hills. Lance couldn't see it from his lower vantage point, but Thomas could, and his face went suddenly paper white. He stared for one more moment, and then grabbed the comm unit's microphone. No, Lance, don't, don't. It's not the enemy. It's not the enemy. It's another bolo. The human voice cracks with strain as it burns suddenly over the command channel, and confusion whips through me. The transmitter's close, very close, and that's not possible. In order to recognize the voice, that is also impossible. I start to reply, but before I can, another voice comes over the channel. Cease transmission. Do not reveal the location. This time, I know the voice. Yet I have never heard it speak so. It has lost its crispness, its sureness. It is the voice of one on the brink of madness. A voice crushed and harrowed by pain, despair, and a purpose that goes beyond obsession. Land. The human voice, a young, male human voice sobs. Please, Lance, it's another bolo, it really is. It is the enemy. The only voice I know replies, and it is higher and shriller. It is the enemy. There is only the enemy. I am Unit 0103, Lima, November, Charlie of the Line. It is my function to destroy the enemy, enemy, the enemy, enemy, enemy. I hear the broken cadence of that voice, and suddenly I understand. I understand everything, and horror fills me. I lock my tracks, slithering to a halt, fighting to avoid what I know must happen, yet understanding it has come too late. And even as I break, LNC round the flank of a hill in a scream of tortured, overstrained tracks in a billowing cloud of dust. For the first time, I see his hideously mauled starboard side, and the gaping wound driven deep, deep into his hull. I can actually see his breached personality center in its depths, see the penetration where the enemy fire ripped brutally into the circuitry of his psychotronic brain, and I understand it all. I hear the madness in the electronic voice, and the determination and courage which must have kept that broken, dying wreck in motion, and the child's voice on the comm is the final element. I know his mission now, the reason he has fought so doggedly, so desperately to cross the Badlands to the life-sustaining shelter of the mountains. Yet, my knowledge changes nothing, but there's no way to avoid him. He staggers and lurches on his crippled tracks, but he's moving at at least almost 80 kilometers per hour. He has no hellbore, no missiles, and his remaining infant repeaters cannot harm me. Yet he retains one final weapon, himself. He thunders toward me, his calm voice silent no more, screaming the single word, Enemy! 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 Again and again. He hurls himself upon me in the suicide attack, charging to his death as the only way he can protect the children he has carried out of hell from the friend he can no longer recognize, the enemy who has hunted him for over 400 kilometers of frozen, waterless stone and dust. It is all that is left, the only thing he can do, and if he carries through with his ramming attack, we will both die, and exposure will kill the children, for anyone can rescue them. I have no choice. He has left me none, and in that instant I wish we were human, that I could wish I could shed the tears which fogged the young voice crying out to his protector to turn aside and save himself. But I cannot weep. There's only one thing I can do. Goodbye, Lance, I send softly over the battalion command net. Forgive me. And I fire. 